And so Popovich is the one who saved us. He brought it in as Cleveland International because CBS couldn't turn it down then. He had the right to sign it. It was sort of assumed that we would sell nothing, you know, except 10 copies in Cleveland. Um, all the time we're doing the record, Popovich is saying, you gotta write me some polkas. Because he also had this guy, Frankie Yank Yankovich, who's the biggest polka artist in the world, <laughs> who's also in Cleveland International, who would do like seven albums a year. Like polkas for April, polkas for June, polkas for July, and then he'd go back next year and do polkas for May, the months he missed, <laughs> polkas for Sunday. You know, he did 100 polka albums. That was his other big artist, so he's telling me, you gotta do a polka album. He just loved whatever music, and he, he was very Eastern European background. And he's the one I, I, I was very proud of. He, he told, one day he comes to me as a personal favor. He says, you got to write a song for my grandparents. They're real old country. They're from the old country, Russia. you got to write a song for them if they'd like. I said, I don't know. I, I can't write Russian. He says, you know, it's like Dr. Zhivago. They use that balalaika thing that sounds like a lute. Oh, write something. Come on, write something. So I wrote this song, uh, It's Only Rock and Roll Balalaika. <laughs> I was very proud of it. It was for Steve Popovich's grandparents. And... Um, Popovich is the one who, like, it was amazing, again, a great lesson in the record industry. If you have one believer, you can get much further than you can with all of Sony or all of Warner Brothers sort of having some interest. You have to have one fanatic believer, and this guy was a fanatic believer. And all he did was have faith in it, and he built it step by step with, like, NEW, one station in New York, one station in Cleveland, and he believed, as I did, that if people heard it, it would catch on. I had no idea it would take about a year to catch on in America. It was one of the strangest stories ever for a record. It became huge overseas before America. In fact, it's the first record I think ever that sold, an American record, that sold something like five million overseas before it even sold 400,000 or so here. Um, we were like platinum in 12 countries overseas and no one even knew who we were here. And it was surreal when we were touring we would be playing places in like Toledo and suburbs of Cleveland. They were always in that area around Cleveland. Um, these little dumps that were, it was great gigs, the audience were great, but dumps. And, um, and then I remember one specifically we were playing, which I think was Toledo, where um, it was dripping, there was liquid dripping on my head. I was playing a really bad piano and this liquid's dripping on my head. And I said to the guy, I finally got someone's attention during the show, and I said, you know, this water's dripping on my head. Is it raining? Can you do something about it? He says, oh, it's not water. It's not rain. Don't worry about it. It's just the plumbing from the toilet. I said, oh, that's reassuring. At least it's bodily fluid. That's not... Uh. And, um, and that was one of the worst nights. It was a typical gig. And the next day, I'm not exaggerating, the next day we flew to Australia and we were met in Melbourne, Australia by about 10,000 people. It was so big in Australia that it knocked Saturday Night Fever off the charts as number one. It's still one of the biggest records of all time, if not the biggest in Australia. And um, we got there, and there was like thousands at the airport. It's one of those Beatles things. Where they, we were delirious. It, was, you know, it felt like a four-week flight. And we get out, and we could hardly move. And all of a sudden, it's a press conference. Like you always see the Beatles with the Pan Am logo behind them. And they're asking this question. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm supposed to be witty like John Lennon or something. I was an idiot. <laughs> we could barely talk English. And um, luckily, in Australia, they don't talk English, so it didn't matter. But... Um, we, we did that, and then we had a convoy of Hell's Angels that took us into the hotel from the airport. Like, a hundred Hell's Angels in this convoy. And it was on the evening news. It was the second biggest story. Uh, Meatloaf has the newspaper, by the way. It's a great newspaper to see because OPEC was the biggest story. The oil prices, they were having a big conference there. And the second biggest story was Meatloaf's arrival. And the next night we did our concert, and of course, he collapsed. And they have this huge headline, Meatloaf's colla Meatloaf Collapse Shock. And there's a big picture of him collapsed. And it's the big headline. And in smaller print, OPEC raises oil prices for the world. And, and then, you know, after about a week, we're back in a little town in um, Dayton, Ohio, with urine coming on my head. And it was totally schizoid. It took forever in America. And it was really interesting that it didn't take forever overseas. And uh, I always found it amazing because uh, I was amazed they could understand the lyrics because there's so many puns and wordplay and things like that. But they totally got it. It's Germany. To this day, the, the, the country that the album sold the most in per capita, this is cool, is Finland. Um, no, Iceland, excuse me, even more obscure, it's Iceland. That's, that's the one that Reykjavik's the capital, right? Yeah, because one night we actually got the opera in Reykjavik and we were asking her the population of the country <laughs> just to find out what it was like. It sold, um, it's the equivalent of 50 times platinum in Reykjavik. I don't, I don't think they give you like a special, I think they give you a, 
um, like an impaled polar bear or something on a plaque. But um, mathematically, they said it works out that every home in Iceland has 10 copies <laughs> of Bat of the Hell. I don't really know how they can figure this out, but it's just an absurd amount of copies in Iceland. I remember I never got to go there. I remember asking Meat years later, what was it like playing in Iceland, Meat? He says, oh, Iceland, it's wild. I said, I imagine it's a really enchanted country. Like, it's the world of like elves and fairies and like magic and sorceries. Really? I don't know, my main memory is that you play big open space, there's like 100,000 kids there, and they're all vomiting and pissing through the whole show. They're just vomiting and pissing, vomiting and pissing. I said, yeah, well, I guess elves and sorcerers do that too. I guess I could reconcile that discrepancy. But that was my image. It will always be that of Iceland, of <laughs> the huge kind of kids pissing and vomiting. Um, but uh, it just took off overseas far before it took off, especially in England. It was huge in England. America, I've always